I'm Mike and today we're going to look at the facts on grass-fed cattle farming and see if it really is the climate solution that people are touting it as. In particular, if the folks who started Cafe Gratitude and later Be Love Farms were doing the best thing for the environment by ditching vegetarianism to raise cattle. If you watched other vegan channels earlier this year, especially if they were based in LA, you probably heard about the owners of Cafe Gratitude and how they ditched vegetarianism after decades to raise cattle for beef. Beef being another term for the dismembered flesh of our lovely fuzzy bovine friends. As you may have guessed, vegans were really pissed the idea of spending money at a vegan establishment and then having that money go to raise cattle pretty bad. So much so that it made the Washington Post. Their farm, called Be Love Farms, is one of those sort of humane washed dreams. It's picturesque. What cow doesn't want to live in California? They preach about becoming at peace with the death of their animals and the cycle of life and all that stuff that really makes for a good serial killer. I have to read this quote in a movie villain voice. It's obligatory. Cows make an extreme sacrifice for humanity, but that is their position in God's plan. As food for the predators, we can be part of that sacrament. Now I have to say, these are the type of farms that are exactly what inspired me to create my Love and Kill Farms video. I mean, they have love in the name of their farm too. We don't name the animals to prevent attachment, but that doesn't keep us from loving them. Hey, cow number nine, would you like a popsicle? I love you so much, I could just eat you up. But now it's time to actually talk about their philosophy and see how the facts stack up. Now the first main point here is that regenerative farming, which is literally in the Bee Love Farms logo, puts beef cattle in the system to sequester carbon. But I'm pretty confident that they didn't actually investigate the topic because if you are trying to use cattle to fight climate change, you should be made aware of a little greenhouse gas called methane. According to this FAO paper, quote, in the global balance of methane production, ruminant livestock accounts for 25.7% of anthropogenic or human made methane production. And as this other FAO paper states plainly on the subject of cattle and methane, quote, with methane having 23 times the global warming potential as CO2 during a 100 year span, only minor amounts of methane need to be emitted to offset gains in CO2 mitigation from soil organic carbon sequestration. In other words, a little bit of methane can offset a lot of carbon sequestration. And as time goes on and new reports like this one from the IPCC come out, that 23 times number has now become 29 times CO2. And when accounting for the way it interacts with aerosols in the atmosphere, it is 32 times as effective a greenhouse gas as CO2 is over a 100 year period. And as this study ironically showed when comparing the allegedly eco-friendly grass-fed cattle to the grain-fed cattle, they were measured emitting four times as much methane. And that didn't even account for how grass-fed cattle only grow at 75% of the rate as grain-fed cattle and therefore emit methane over a longer period of time, all because grass is just harder to digest. All right, let's see just how much a cow can burp. We're gonna do some math. We're gonna compare how much greenhouse gases are being emitted by the biology of different farming systems, whether plant or animal, on one hectare of land. A number I see on livestock sites is 2.7 animals per hectare of land. Then a lower estimation for methane emissions per head is 80 kilograms per year. Multiply that by 2.7 animals by 32 for the equivalence of CO2. And that is 7,000 kilograms or 15,800 pounds of CO2 equivalent, which once we subtract the weight of oxygen to just get pure carbon, comes in at around 2,000 kilograms or 4,500 pounds of carbon equivalent. Now to establish a range, we can look to the widely cited amount of 120 kilograms of methane per animal per year, which comes out to be over 10,000 kilograms or 22,800 pounds of CO2 equivalent or 3,000 kilograms or 6,500 pounds of raw carbon. Now to turn that into a standard unit so that we can compare it to carbon sequestration, it becomes two to three megagrams of carbon equivalent per hectare per year. 
But as this Union of Concerned Scientists paper mentions, you can knock those methane emissions down by 15 to 30% by mixing up the species on the pasture. So let's take that total and knock 30% off the low range. So now we are at 1.5 to 3 megagrams of carbon equivalent per hectare per year. Okay, now let's see how much these systems typically store. Overgrazing will lose you about 0.2 megagrams of carbon per hectare per year from the soil, but as this study showed, average grass pasture will store about 0.12 to 0.3 megagrams of carbon, but if you take poorly managed cropland and convert it to pasture, you can get one megagram of carbon per hectare per year of sequestration. So right away, it's not looking great, and I'm sure there are different techniques with different climates and different species of grass that can probably sequester more. But if you are taking an average bite of grass-fed meat in the Western world, if you trace that piece of animal flesh back, this is what it'll look like. At this point, it's worth mentioning that if we took that same 2.7 animal amount that's on a hectare and made them grain-fed instead, then they would be down at around 0.4 megagrams. All right, let's look and see how this compares to other farming systems. And the numbers I'm about to add, their sources will be linked in the description below. I don't want to keep flashing the studies and give you a seizure. All right, tall grass prairie with no animals seems to come in at around 0.7 megagrams. Other trees are lower, but hardwood trees can get you 2.9 megagrams. Most crops are anywhere between 0.07 to 0.8 megagrams, if they aren't poorly managed and losing topsoil at least. But a well-managed corn system with no tilling can get you as high as 3.7 megagrams. Vegetable sequestration seems to average about 1.0 to 2.5 megagrams, but has been reported as high as 6.4 megagrams of carbon per hectare per year. Now there is one type of livestock that I do approve of, and that is earthworms. They were shown to increase the system by over 2 megagrams. By now, I hope it's clear that you don't need to emit massive amounts of methane to store carbon. But didn't Alan Savory write that paper showing that methane emissions from cattle just don't matter? I have a whole video on him from a while back, but today we're just gonna stick to methane. He points to how, yeah, ruminant population and methane atmospheric concentrations were super correlated until recently when methane sort of leveled out, well, the population of ruminants kept on going up. That's like saying since SUV usage isn't perfectly correlated with atmospheric CO2 concentrations, that we should feel perfectly fine driving our Hummers around as much as we want. In reality, all this means is that, well, methane from cattle is still a huge portion of total methane, it's not 100% of it, which we already knew. The most ironic part, though, is that there's good reason to believe that that break in methane concentration and ruminant population could have been because we are now feeding more of these ruminants grain, which decreases their methane emissions. You know, at that time, feedlots were popping up all over the world. Between 1992 and 2007, the amount of factory farmed dairy cows in the U.S. doubled. Half of lamb in the world are now grain fed, and the list goes on. But no matter what the real reason for that dip in methane, the levels have continued to surge again. So despite Alan's paper being written last year, its methane levels are already out of date. Alan also points to methanotrophs in his paper, which are methane-eating microbes, saying that basically all of the methane that gets emitted by cattle, since the pasture is going to be so healthy, is just going to get sucked back up by those methanotrophs. Firstly, microbes can only interact with the gases right around them, and they're not just creating a giant vacuum sucking down. The tendency is for these gases to rise, which is why most of the methane in the atmosphere is concentrated in the stratosphere. I don't think these microbes are getting up there. Allen concludes with, quote, that ruminant methane production is of any significance in this 250% increase in atmosphere is a vanishingly small possibility. You know what? According to the EPA, transportation is responsible for 26% of our total greenhouse gas emissions, the same exact percentage of methane emissions that ruminant livestock are responsible for. Is there a vanishingly small possibility that transportation affects climate change? Ah! But going back to Cafe Gratitude and Bee Love Farms, it is clear that carbon is not their only motivator for doing this. No, wildlife is another motivator with, quote, Earthbound's margarine is made from Canadian canola, organic or not. This product requires a plow to destroy Canadian prairie, an act of violence against burrowing owls, ferrets, prairie dogs, 
dozens of insects and bird species. If that prairie had been maintained in grassland with well-managed cows or buffalo, those species would not be killed or displaced. Sounds like he took this thinking right out of the book of Claudio Bertonati, the Argentine naturalist that I covered in my recent videos. Vegans don't think they kill animals, but they do. As I covered this already, I will lightning round through this. Number one, a vegan diet uses one eighth as much land as a standard omnivorous diet. If we all went vegan, we'd be able to take the land that we're using to currently raise livestock and dedicate it to wildlife. And when I say massive, I mean about one third of the ice-free land as this report showed. One third, imagine if animals had control over one third of your house. Oh, hey, dogs or cats probably already do. Harvesting deaths alone make a vegan diet a better choice by saving 15 to 20 times more animals. Yes, this is not completely relevant to a grass-fed situation. This is mainly for grain-fed, but it is relevant to virtually all meat eaten in our current food system. Number three, at least here in the US, we pay our government to kill astronomical numbers of predators. I could argue that, hey, livestock is the number one threat to timber wolves, but canola farming isn't. However, that's pointless because number four, you can farm in ways other than monocropping. You can use polycultures, which allow for a large amount of habitat for wild animals if you don't have enough with the one third of ice-free land that you freed up. In the end, you don't have to spew massive amounts of earth-warming methane to sequester carbon, and you don't have to kill big, beautiful animals to save wildlife. In fact, there's nothing in the Bee Love Farms logic that says that you have to kill your animal friends. They could theoretically just have an animal sanctuary, but they decide not to. And if your response is, but they can't make money off that, then you're in the territory of killing animals to make money. So in conclusion, there is a very dark side to grass-fed beef. In addition to the dark side of eating animal flesh, it's that methane is getting spewed a lot. So we should just focus on methods of plant farming that sequester a ton of carbon without spewing all the methane. All right, that's it for today. Feel free to let me know down below if any of those carbon numbers were fudged because there were a lot of numbers there to fudge. All right, thanks for watching and see you next time. Remember, it's Love and Kill Farms, putting me, um, inhumane.